Okay, I was just fixing my, uh, my little recorder thing. There we go. And just realized that I had like a third of a battery left, and I was like, no way that's going to work. <laughs> well, thanks for everybody uh, who's taken some time out of your schedule so that you can be here. Um, I don't feel like it's something that's uh, taking your time. It's something that's investing your time. Amen? We want to invest our lives. The whole reason that we are here and not immediately raptured into heaven the moment that we're born again is because Jesus loves this world and he's come to live inside of us so that he can carry on the same works that he was doing 2,000 years ago when he only had one little body that could walk around in Galilee and Nazareth. But now his body's gotten a lot larger. When you came into Christ, Christ came into you. And that's what this is all about. It's about Jesus being himself in you. And it's not hard for Jesus to be amazing. The problem is we're really used to Jesus being amazing, but then we get this mindset, oh, well, that's a Jesus thing, but you know, I have to do my best to try to live a good moral life and keep my nose clean because everybody knows that Jesus stopped being amazing as soon as he was ascended into heaven. No, he didn't stop being amazing. He just planted himself inside of us, and he's waiting for us to renew our mind to his, to renew our life to his, so that we can no longer be the ones that are living, but we can say like Paul, hey, we were crucified 2,000 years ago. It's no longer us living. It's not me trying my best to be a good little person or a bad little person or whatever I was doing. I mean, nobody pretty much is waking up in the morning saying, hey, how can I live a mediocre Christian life? I really don't believe that. But I believe that, that most people have had a, an experience that's been very similar to mine. That you come to Christ and you believe in Jesus so that you can be forgiven because you're very aware of all your failings, right? And you know that God is good and God is perfect and that with you in control of your life, life isn't going so well. You need God. We were created to know Him and to be like Him and to have Him in our lives. And without God, things don't fit. And then all of a sudden you look at Jesus and you realize that's the solution to my whole issue. I need more than just an instruction manual from heaven so that I can do my best to apply principles. If I was good at applying principles, I wouldn't need Jesus. Yes. Amen? Yes. But I need more than a prophet. I need more than someone who's just going to tell me what God says I'm supposed to do. I need forgiveness from God, but I need something more. I don't just want to go around being, you know, uh, being a bad person. You know, I don't, I don't want just to be forgiven. I want to be changed. I want to be made new. I want to be set free. And that's what Jesus does. That He says, look, with you, nothing's going to work. But with me, all things are possible. Amen? Apart from me, it doesn't work. But with me, it works. Because He is the power. He is the life. He is the source of everything that we're supposed to have. So... Um, over these next three days, um, you guys are co- probably going to get to be a little bit acquainted with one another, get to be a little bit acquainted with me, and I'm really looking forward to that. My favorite thing to do is not just to come in. Like There's times where churches will have me come in, and they'll just have me do one service, and, it'll, and, and they say, we'd like you to pray for the sick at the end. Well, I said, you know, what I'd really like to do is teach you that Jesus can use any Christian. And I'd like to show you how that that works because it's not about me. It's not about some famous dude up on the television raising money. It's about Jesus and what he will do through any believer if they understand who Jesus is in them and what he will do through any believer. Amen? Yes. Now that's exciting. Um, and, and it's not something that's based on emotions. You know, a lot of, a lot of healing ministries have been criticized because they do a lot to try 
to get the atmosphere just right and get the room all hyped up, you know, and, and you never know what's really real or what's just emotion and hype, you know. Um, and, and so I saw that. And I also saw the televangelists, you know, scandals in the 80s. And I saw the 60-minute programs, you know, of, uh, of, of the fakers and the charlatans. And so I was like, all I've ever wanted is to be an authentic Jesus follower. All I've ever wanted is to not be uh, somebody who's just doing church out of habits to kind of keep God off my back, you know, or my parents off my back, <laughs> you know. And now I moved out of the house and I've got a big father in the sky, you know, and I don't want him to be upset at me. And, you know, that kind of a mindset. I, you know, I, I tell people this. I said, look, God did not send His Son to die on a cross to get your butt into a building on Sunday mornings. He didn't do that. That's not why He paid such a high price. He died to get everything that hell put into you out of you and to put Himself inside of you. Isn't that a good thing? I mean, God is not religious. It's us that's so religious, you know, that we, we, we keep putting God in a special building, not our house and our lives and not our, the way that we live in, in 24-7. Or we keep associating God with those special people, you know, the ones that are on TV or the ones that are up at the front of the church, you know, or the clergymen. Instead of saying, wait a second, no, I am made in the image of God. I am redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ lives in me. I am a temple of the Holy Spirit. Wherever I go, God is there. And so let me ask you, is it hard for God to heal? It's not. Is it against His nature? Is that something that, you know, you read the Bible and you can just tell God doesn't like healing people? What Bible are you reading? You know, but yet I meet so many Christians that you start talking about healing the sick, and it's like, people, red flag and sirens, woo, you're one of them. You know, I was like, what? I just believe the Bible. I just believe in Jesus. I just believe that He's the same today, yesterday, and forever. And He happens to, to be different in only one thing His location. Now He lives in me. Yes, thank you. He's not stopped living a lifestyle of compassion, of mercy, of power, of healing. He's not stopped that. But the problem is, if we believe that He stopped it, if we believe that was only for Jesus 2,000 years ago, and it's not for every believer, we will stop it. Because Jesus said that whoever believes in me, the works that I do, he'll do also. And even greater, because I go to the Father. Isn't that good news? So Jesus' doctrinal statement about every believer, that it's a whosoever thing. Whoever believes in me, the works I do, he will do also. Are you doing those works? You're doing them to the degree that you believe in Jesus, and that He is bigger than all of the the experiences that you've had, all of the, the prejudice, the things that have gone on or that haven't happened. Jesus is the truth, but sometimes we allow our circumstances to speak louder than Jesus. We take our circumstances to start telling us the truth. Oh, we've been praying for so long and so and so, and they just didn't get any better. Okay, so has that changed Jesus? No. Did it? Did that change who Jesus is? Okay, well maybe we're still growing up into Him. Maybe there's some things that we need to keep pressing in for. Amen? You know, how many, how many, I mean, we expect, we, we're Americans, you know, we like, you put it in the microwave, you know, here's my, here's my raw sickness and disease, you know, put it in the microwave, I do my little deep, 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 out 60 seconds, ding, here comes the miracle, pa-pa, you know, and we like everything just to be nice and automatic and easy and quick, don't we? And we like to use the Bible for formulas to try to make our life easier, comfortable, better, don't we? But Jesus doesn't have healing to give us. He gives us Himself. 
he, you know, a lot of Christians will say, would you pray that God would give me patience? No, I won't pray that. Would you pray that God will give, help me to be bold? No, I won't pray that. Why? Because God has no plan to give you patience. His plan is to give you Himself as your life. And as, if, as you let go of you and grab hold of Him and start learning how to ride a jetpack, I mean, He's got power to take you where you can't go. It's easy for Jesus to fly. Amen? It's easy for Him to be Himself. But we have to learn to stop trusting in ourselves and letting Him be Himself in us. And not just in us, but through us. Amen? I mean, everybody gets saved when they believe in Jesus. Right? When they realize, wait a second, I've blown it. And I need God. And I thank God that Jesus did something amazing. That God Almighty sent His Son to do something incredible. He lived a perfect life for me. (laughs) How many perfectionists we got in the room? You know, I'm a recovering perfectionist. All right? So I see one hand up. There's a bunch of liars in here. Okay, I'm going to start preaching on lying now, you know? (laughs) All right. So look, we know Jesus said, Be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Amen? How are you guys doing on that one? Hey, I'm doing pretty good now. Because you know what? I realized... That, all, that, that God's plan was that He became part of this human race. He lived a perfect life on my behalf. He did the hard work for me. The life that we should have paid God, Jesus lived it so He could pay it to God for all of us. And not only that, we owe God a death because we use this life to sin against Almighty God. And Jesus Christ went to the cross on our behalf, paying for our forgiveness so that we can go free. But then He did something even more amazing in time, space, and history, so we wouldn't have to guess whether this is real or whether this is just some sort of religious theory or philosophy. This is no myth. This is time, space, history with eyewitnesses, both of those who ended up believing and those who were dire enemies. Nobody could refute the fact that this crucified man who claimed he was the Son of God broke the power of death and came walking out of a tomb. Amen? Amen. And He's alive. He's got power greater than sickness, greater than sin, greater than the Roman government, greater than corrupt, hypocritical, religious liars and bigots. All of that stuff that conspires to oppress humanity. Sickness, disease, lying, cheating, stealing, backbiting, betraying, oppression from the government, oppression from religion, condemnation, making fun, all of that's humiliating, held down, pierced through, naked, laughed at. He went through it all and wasn't bitter, wasn't disillusioned, wasn't, didn't have his feelings hurt, didn't say, well, forget you guys. He didn't do that. What did he do? He said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. That's the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And he came smoking out of the tomb three days later. Amen? And what's the first thing he did after he gathered all his disciples together? Says that he said, See here, it's me. And then he breathed on them. He breathed them the Holy Spirit, gave them what he was carrying inside of him. What's the first thing that God did with that lump of clay? He got down on his knees. He made a little lump of clay in a garden and went... Amen? He bought us back 
so that He could breathe the breath of God into us again. To restore us right to God's original purpose, His original creation. That all of those things that we felt had made us no longer of any use. Oh, we'll never be what God says we were that we can be. We'll never be image bearers of God. We will never display what God is like uh, in the physical creation. That's what God created us to be. Amen? Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And what does it say in verse 28? And let them rule. Yes, that's right. Holy smokes. When God created you, He created a ruler. But for you to rule rightly, you first must bear His image so that you display what He's like. Amen? Because the kingdom of darkness likes to take power to rule over and to oppress and to beat down. You ever notice that? People who are rulers that aren't born again, they like to take their power and just smush people down. They, they'll crawl all over top of everybody just to get to the top, you know? Lie, cheat, steal. I'm not talking about the elections or nothing like that. Even in democratic countries, you know, where we got all these processes, you still see that nature. You see it in junior high, <laughs> don't you? Yeah, that's right. And the world can be so shallow, but God's not that way. He gives us His power to empower us from the inside. So now, what do we do? We take the power that God gives us to set people free, to set them free from oppression, to set them free from... Uh, that's what Jesus used His power for, right? That's right. Amen. He didn't, he didn't just use it to do fancy pants, uh, you know, um, Jack be nimble, Jack be quick sort of things like uh, Chris Angel or something like that. He used His power to set people free, to set people free from devils, to set people free from sickness, disease, Disease, to set people free even from death, raise people from the dead. He set people free from religious uh, bigotry. And uh, I mean, think about it. The, the woman who was, who was caught in the very act of adultery. I mean, we would think that God being so holy, that what he would really like to do with her is just crush her. That's what the way a religious person thinks. But Jesus showed us, He said, if you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. Amen? Amen. If you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. So, what do we see about the Father in Jesus? We see that He sets people free. He doesn't oppress them. He's our help in times of trouble. He's not our troublemaker. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's so good. Because so many times we have so much trouble, and if you, if you only know God as Creator, then you think that your trouble is from God. Because God created everything, He's all-knowing he's, he's all and all-powerful, and He's got all this power, then this must be God's plan or God's will for my life to have all of this trouble. Now, some of the trouble you're not going to get out of, right? But some things Jesus showed us. Wait a second. When it comes to sickness and disease, He treated that different than trials and tribulations and persecutions, didn't He? See, He bore our sin and our iniquity at the cross. So all of the judgment that you deserve and that I deserve for our sin, Jesus willingly suffered for it. He offered Himself a sacrifice. So all of those things that you're worried about God judging you and being angry with you, look unto Jesus. He has set you free. God is not judging you. You are free indeed when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Not so that you can go on and carry on in your sin, but so that sin will never separate you from God once again. You can just walk right into His presence, completely righteous, completely forgiven, completely justified. Isn't that good? Yes, yes. Amen. I mean, think of it this way, guys. I mean, look. 
When you are born again, now your heart is awakened unto righteousness. You actually care about what God wants, don't you? You want to live in a right relationship with God. But most of us ain't real good at living in right relationship with God to start off with, are we? Um, and so if you're not careful, the enemy will use the fact that now your conscience is awakened, you're connected with God, and you want to live that life that is pleasing to God because now your whole life is not about you. It's a relationship. Everything I do, whether I eat or whether I drink, I do it all for His glory. Amen? That's what's awakened inside of me. Everything matters because God matters and I matter. And this whole thing is not about me anymore. I've died and I live unto Him. Amen? Amen. So, now you've got that, but if you don't understand how to live and to tap into the power of Jesus Christ for living... There's going, to be, there's going to be some dissonance. Sometimes you're going to say things that you're like, oh man, I wish I shouldn't have said that. Or, oh, I shouldn't have watched that. Or, oh, I shouldn't have walked by that person. I should have helped him. Or, you know, you have all these things. And if you're not careful, then the enemy will say, see, you're unrighteous. You're not good. He'll start telling you. And you know what? I just want to let you know something. Listen to me. Now, if Jesus comes to live in you, Is He your righteousness or is He just making up the difference between what you've got to bring to the table? He's 100% our righteousness. See, a lot of Christians have this mindset, okay, that I'm going to do the best I can to do everything that God wants. And so maybe today I'll make it 50% of the way. Right? Thank God for Jesus. He makes up the other 50% is the way a lot of Christians think. That's not the gospel. It's not. Do you know in Philippians chapter 3 that Paul had to repent of thinking that he had anything to credit to his account? I thought I was the right tribe, the tribe of Benjamin. I was zealous for God. I had all these things, but whatever I thought was to my credit, I had to count as loss. Why? So that I could know Christ. And the, it, right? Yes. The, not having a righteousness of my own. I've got no righteousness of my own, but only that which is through faith. I am completely right with God because of Jesus. He's 100% my righteousness. And so what does that mean? Does that mean that now we go off and live any old way? No, He's not only my righteousness on the outside, He came to live on in me on the inside. So now I actually have the righteousness of Jesus inside of me. His Spirit is now leading me to live like a son of God. And I can't escape that. Some of you tried. You tried to ignore God. And it didn't work. You couldn't get very far, could you? Forever how much you tried on the outside, your inside was tethered, wasn't it? I I used this little illustration. I just thought of it this week, so I think it must be for you guys. It's kind of cool. So I had this conversation with somebody and I said, listen, do you understand that, when, that while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you? It says that in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Amen? That's good news. But do you understand that that's past tense, while you were sinners? So before you ever cared anything about doing God's will, God died for you. Jesus died for you to demonstrate His love. That that my love for you is not, not because of something you've done to provoke that. All you have done is to provoke my anger and my judgment. But I never paid any attention to that because I looked way back at what I created you for. And I created you to bear my image. You are worth dying for to me. So I died for you while you were a sinner. But guess what? As soon as you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you become born again, you're not a sinner. You're not a sinner. God changes you. You are born again. You're made a saint. Do you understand that that means a holy one? If you translated that literally, you are now holy. And it's not just on the outside. You are completely holy and set aside on the outside. But your essential nature has changed. That's why it says in 1 John that 
those who are righteous live righteously. Amen? Why? It's because there's something that changed on the inside. That someone who has true faith, they can't carry on in in sin like they could before. One of the ways that we know that we've been changed is that our relationship with sin has changed. When I was in high school, I used to run around and I used to go to all the parties and I used to chase the girls and catch a few of them. And, you know, it was like high fives in the locker room, all the cool, all the stuff we had done. And then went off to college and it got worse. And this emptiness inside of me is like, man, somebody's lied to me because this is just not, I mean, I'm getting everything that all the movies say that I should be having fun. It's supposed to look like fun. And actually, I pretend like I am having fun because I just want people to think think that I'm having fun because people who aren't acting like they're having fun nobody wants to be around them you know and I like my friends but the truth was I was empty on the inside and then God came to me one night I hope that doesn't bother you because I can't explain it any other way except I'm sitting there goof I'm I'm praying now I lay me down to sleep sort of prayer and I just did some mortal sinning And if I die, please don't send me to hell (laughs) kind of prayer. And then all of a sudden, for some reason, I became very aware that God was very real. And then it's like he hacked my computer. And then all of a sudden, on the inside of me, I have this thought go off very strongly. Tonight's Friday night. Tomorrow night's Saturday night. You have the same thing planned with the same group of people. Who do you think you are fooling? And I was like, oh my gosh. God isn't buying these religious loopholes, right? Because I thought you just go party it up and go to confession. Hope somebody kills you before you (laughs) screw it up again. (laughs) That was my hope. I hoped I could get martyred. Uh, I had heard in a Catholic Sunday school class that martyrs go to heaven. So I said, wow, I don't want to do that. What do I do? And I was thinking about my life and I was like, you know, I was winning at everything but I was empty and it said whoever tries to save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for me and the gospels will save it I realized that was my whole problem I was I was thinking I was going to turn over a new leaf or I was going to live life on my own terms and Jesus said it's not about martyrdom true faith is turning your life in You give yourself up to me with the faith that I can give you life and forgiveness See, I knew the Easter story. I knew the Christmas story. I just didn't know how that related to me. You understand? And so that's what I did. I said, yes. That's, that was my sinner's prayer. Yeah, I was like, yeah. And I don't know what happened, but I knew something had happened. I sat up in my bedroom. This is like 2 o'clock in the morning at a college campus. Nobody's in there. And I go, woo! <laughs> Why? Because I knew something had changed. And the next morning, I got on the phone with an old girlfriend who was too Christian for me at the time. And I said, I, th- I think I might have just become a Christian. Do you have an extra Bible? And she met me in a, in a library, uh, campus library parking lot and gave me an extra Bible. I started reading it. And all of a sudden, this book that had been kind of this mysterious thing that I could never understand... It was like it was registering with me. It was like words would sometimes leap off the page. But it wasn't that. It was my spirit. The spirit that was inside of me was leaping towards those words. Because the same spirit that was in me was the spirit that wrote those words. Amen? And it's the same for you now. If you have Jesus living in you, your whole nature has changed. Now you want to do what's right. And so this was the illustration I came up with and said, you know, uh, I, I said this to somebody and they took great exception. Oh no, you're still a sinner even after you get born again because you can still sin. And she started going off this, you know, what about this pastor? You know, he preached and blah, blah, blah. And he's, and, okay, wait a second. You're buying into the same thing that is the biggest lie. Do you understand that that even though a Christian maintains the ability to sin, right? It's no longer the essential part of your nature. Because when you die, guess what? That's not going with you. It's not part of you anymore. Sin, in Romans 7, that power remains um, operating in your mortal body. But get, and so when Christians decide they're going to live out of the own, their own power, they end up committing sin. 
But they're sinning against their nature. Their nature, their spirit of God inside your spirit won't let you go on and on and on in that. The spirit of God is always leading you to live like a son and to live free and to live holy, to live in the power of God. Amen? So it's the difference like, if you can imagine this way, that there's this pool of the world, you know, and, and uh, there's, there's this realm beneath. And you were born a sponge. You know, the, the darkness that was in the world was also inside of you, wasn't it? It doesn't matter how much you wring that sponge out. If it stays in the water, it's going to just soak it back up. But when you got born again, you became a beach ball. Right? Because now your nature is from above and you contain that inside of you. And so while we are in this body, we still have contact. And there's a possibility, right? We still have contact with the world. We're not completely free from it yet, but we're free from it. Even though... There's that possibility. And I tell you what, you take the beach ball and you hold it under and everything in it is going to be trying to get up. Amen? And do you understand that even if you've blown it, that the proverb says this, that a righteous man may stumble seven times, but he gets back up. Do you understand that it is not your stumbling, it's not your falling that defines you to God. A righteous man... Say, say this with me. I am righteous because of Jesus. The old is gone. The new has come. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. I am in Christ. Christ is in me. I am brand new. The old is gone. Amen. So, I want you to know what you contain is not just got the power to lift you up. It's got the power to set other people free. It's got the power to help and bless other people. Okay? See where I'm at. Okay. So what we're going to do, since we're going to be together for just a little bit, um, my plan is that about every so often, kind of like now, we're going to have a little 10-minute break just so everybody can get up, refresh, let your mind breathe just a little bit. Um, and, uh, and then we'll be back here no later than 10 minutes. Check out the book table. Um, if there's anybody that is going to be going through the training, um, if you want to, it's completely optional, but we're going to be using this uh, training manual, the Divine Healing Training Manual. I've got 20 or so copies out there. Um, Let me know if we run out and we need to get some more made up. We could probably do that. Um, There's other stuff out there that will help you. Um, uh, But uh, one of the things that I want to encourage people to do is a lot of times people come in here and they have questions. They have serious questions about all this stuff. And this is three days. So let's get some of these questions answered. All right. So we're going to we're going to cover a lot of things that mean most of the time it's kind of the same questions over and over because I do this all over the place. And I find that the church has basically been taught. Uh, the same things that are just bringing a lot of confusion. But every now and again, I run up against a new question, so that's fine. I want to make sure we cover that. So what I've done is I've put some um, index cards, the sound booth back there, right on the corner. Craig, could you point those out? There's just a stack of those index cards right there. Yeah, so if you have a question... Pick one of those up, write out your question, and if you could, just come and put it up here on the... uh, podium before uh, the next session and we'll hit a few of those each time. We'll start off our sessions by answering a question because you know sometimes I'm itching over here and you got a real itch right back there and man how many of you know when you got one of them things going on it's really hard to feel real appreciative about somebody scratching your shoulder up here. (laughs) So we want to do that Uh, and each night uh, so tonight is Thursday night we're going to try to knock off right at nine o'clock because tomorrow night's a work tomorrow's a work day for a lot of people tomorrow night's Friday uh, we won't be as time conscious there Uh, and then Saturday uh, we've got a full day ahead of us too so it'll be a good time so we'll break here and so we'll be back here in about 10 minutes